Welcome to the uh, 32nd Theoretical Physics Colloquium by Professor Hong Liu from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He got his PhD in 1997 from Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. Uh, after that, he had two years postdoctoral position between 1997 and 1999 at the Imperial College London. Then he was a research associate between 1999 and 2003 at New High Energy Theory Center at Rutgers University. And after that, he got his faculty position at Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 2003. He remains there since then. He had uh, received many honors and awards over the time. He was an Alfred Sloan Fellow between 2004 and 2008, an outstanding junior investigator for DOE 2005-2010, a Simons Fellow from Simons Foundation in 2012. He also received Simon Fellow uh, Professorship from Galileo Galilei Institute for Theoretical Physics in 2018 and Guggenheim Fellowship from the Corresponding Foundation in 2019. He is uh, an editor of the journal of High Energy Physics since 2010 and his research interests are uh, at the interface of string theory, quantum gravity, nuclear physics, condensed matter physics. And today he will be giving the talk about the hydrodynamics of exotic quantum matter, about the reasonable and unreasonable effectiveness of hydrodynamics in exotic quantum uh, matter. So with that, I'll give the microphone to Hong. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Igor, for the introduction. And it's a great pleasure uh, to, uh, to give a, a lecture in this series. Um, yeah, so, uh, so today's talk is about hydrodynamics. Uh, a fluid phenomenon are uh, ubiquitous um, in our life. Yeah, for example, in our body, which is essential for life. And also when we travel and all kinds of natural disasters. It's also very important, say, for the, uh, what's happening inside the Earth and what's happening inside the sun, and also for galaxy formation, uh, etc. So hydrodynamics, of course, have a very long history, uh, dating back to, um, say, Archimedes, 2000 BC, and many other people, say Da Vinci, Newton, etc., have made, uh, um, yeah, uh, 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 made contributions to this, uh, to this subject. And so the very basic idea of the hydrodynamics is to approximate your medium, say, using so-called fluid approximation. Is that you treat your system as a continuum, say, of fluid elements. And each element is considered to be actually a macroscopic object to be in local equilibrium. Okay, so uh, say you can label the fluid element by space-time points, and then, uh, then associate with each space-time point you can associate with local thermodynamic variables, say the density, uh, temperature, and also the local velocity, et cetera. So this is so-called uh, uh, Euler description uh, of the fluid. So the basic idea is that you express your energy and momentum in terms of those uh, uh, phenological variables. And then, then, the, then the equations for the hydrodynamics just given by the energy and the momentum conservation. Or, or continuity equations, okay? So it's very simple, but, ha uh, but has been extremely powerful, okay? The hydrodynamics also have made some unexpected entries in 21st century physics. So here I will describe uh, uh, three examples. So, uh, so one example is the, uh, is the quark one plasma. Uh, at room temperature, quarks and gluons are always confined say inside the hydrons, say protons, neutrons, pions, et cetera. Yeah, just due to the, uh, due to the confinement. But if you uh, raise the system, say at very high temperature, and then, uh, then the quarks and the gluons inside the hydrons, they, they, they can be released, okay? They become deconfined, and then they can uh, freely roaming around and so uh, form so-called quark ground plasma. A quark plasma has been, uh, say, an idea which has been realized very early on uh, in the discovery of the QCD. But finally, uh, around, uh, uh, around the year 2000, 
uh, has been uh, explicitly yeah, that, uh, uh, realized in the lab, uh, uh, first in the Brookhaven, and also currently uh, is studied at LHC. So the basic idea uh, to create quagon plasma in the uh, experiment is through these so-called so heavy ion collisions. So consider you consider say two very heavy nuclei like, like NAT. So each contain, uh, so here like two lead uh, nuclei, uh, uh, each contain 208 nucleons. And then, so you accelerate them at very high energy and then you collide them, okay. So, so, so when you collide them, then a large number of nucleons say within each uh, 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 nucleus, they, they interact with each other. And then the, the collision energy, yeah, through those interactions, the collision energy essentially uh, can be converted into internal energy. And the internal energy then can be used to, uh, to thermalize the system. And if the energy is high enough, then you can melt the nucleons to form the quagron plasma. And so, so, so after the collide, some of the nucleons, they pass through each other, but then between them, and then you, uh, uh, those nucleons which are success, successfully uh, uh, interact with each other, they form this quagron plasma. Okay, then the system expands. And when the system expands, then actually just like an expanding universe, they also, uh, the system also cools down, okay. And eventually uh, 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 when the temperature drops below the, um, the, the crossover to the deconfined phase, and then, and then this uh, 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 the degree freedom in this quantum plasma will again uh, hydronize. So in your, uh, yeah, uh, um, yeah, so, uh, so this quagron plasma formed in the, um, uh, in this high man collision is very tiny, say, uh, uh, just the typical size of a nucleon, uh, a nucleus, say it's about 10 to the minus 14 meter, and they exist for a very short time, say 10 to the ma uh, minus 23 seconds, and uh, uh, has a very high temperature. Yeah, so as I mentioned, say eventually this quagron plasma will hydronize, so what do you measure in the experiment? Uh, hydronize the particles in your detectors. Okay, so in your detector, you just, uh, 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 so this is an uh, um, uh, example at, uh, at the LHC, which the, uh, the 10,000 particle trajectories of the, um, yeah, of the particles uh, uh, hydronized from this quagron plasma. So experimental challenge is to say, when you measure the tracks of all these particles, and you study their correlations. And from, from those correlations, you try to deduce the physical properties of the quagron plasma, which formed during this very short interval. Okay. So it turns out this highly complicated, uh, uh, it turns out that uh, those particles actually, uh, they have very intricate correlation between them. It turns out those correlations can be explained in a very simple way, just using hydrodynamics, say, if you assume that this quagron plasma formed very quickly, say uh, uh, immediately, say say after the heavy ion collision, and then and then their uh, subsequent evolution uh, should follow the uh, hydrodynamics, and then you can just evolve the um, yeah uh, the quagron plasma using hydrodynamics, and then you can make prediction uh, uh, what the uh, correlation should be uh, uh, after uh, uh, yeah after it has uh, uh, hydronized. So anyway, this hydrodynamic was beautifully, and uh, um, uh, 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 essentially tells us the quagron plasma behaves like a fluid, okay, rather than rather than like a gas of particles, which yeah, rather than like ideal gas, uh, um, yeah. So in fact, this uh, uh, not only like a fluid, like a fluid with very very small uh, viscosity, is almost like a perfect fluid. So if you assume that this uh, uh, fluids uh, uh, without viscosity uh, uh, actually already give you a reasonable, uh, um, say, approximation uh, uh, to those correlations. So another example uh, is graphene. So graphene was discovered uh, in 2004 and uh, got a Nobel Prize a few years later. And so the typical idea when we think about electrons, say in the metal, is that you have say some impurities and then electrons move ballistically uh, in the metal. And that uh, uh, in fact is how we say derive the conductivity say, um, yeah, for metal. 
It turns out, uh, for uh, for electrons in the graphene, so, so one feature of the, uh, of the graphene is that it can be made very very pure. Okay, so essentially, uh, you can assume that the impurities don't exist. And it turns out that the uh, uh, electrons in graphene actually behaves more like a fluid rather than uh, uh, like ballistic particles. Okay, so here is a very simple uh, 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 setup to uh, to check. Uh, uh, that actually graphene uh, electrons in the graphene do behave like a fluid. So let's imagine you have a slab of graphene, which is the blue region here. Okay, you have a slab of graphene, and then you put the potential difference uh, 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 between the upper layer and the lower layer at say at two points. Okay, say you put some electrical charge there, and put some potential difference, and if the uh, electrons in the graphene they just move ballistically like we normally assume for metals. So that's what you will see. Then you will just see the standard coolant flow. So there will be currents flow from up and down, and then you can measure the resistance. And the resistance will be, say, positive. Okay. But if graphene, uh, uh, but if the gra uh, electron behaves like a fluid, so in principle, if there's some viscous flow, and then, uh, then the the collective motion of the fluid will generate this kind of backflow. Okay, so you, uh, there will be uh, uh, vortices generated, and so so the consequence of the backflow is that when you measure the resistance, and then because of this uh, uh, current flows in the opposite direction to the direction of your potential difference, and then you will actually uh, seemingly detect an active resistance. Okay, and then the detection of the active resistance. Then can be considered as a, a, a strong indication uh, uh, that actually um, electrons don't move ballistically. Somehow they have some kind of collective fluid like motion. And indeed, this is the experiment done uh, almost, yeah, so this was the theoretical uh, prediction made by, uh, uh, by my colleague Levitov and Fokovich uh, at the Weizmann Institute uh, uh, in February of 2016. And uh, yeah, around the same time, so the so the GAM group in, in Manchester, they precisely did did this kind of experiments, and they did uh, uh, observe the active local resistance. Okay, and so uh, uh, so that's a strong support that somehow the uh, electrons uh, in the graphene actually they they behave more more like a fluid. So here is the third uh, my third example. So let's consider uh, uh, archer cold Fermi gases. Say, uh, uh, so this picture shows a confined uh, cigar shape, a cloud of uh, leasing atoms, okay, uh, fermionic leasing atoms. And the color coding means the density of the atoms. And so, uh, so this is at a very low temperature, uh, 10 to the minus nine uh, uh, Kelvin. And those atoms uh, are concentrated, say, um, yeah, uh, they, yeah, so you can tune the interaction. Uh, 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 between the atoms uh, uh, so that they are near this so-called utilitarity limit. So the atoms are, are very strongly interacting with each other. So now, now you can do an experiment. So you start with the initial cigar configuration and which is due to the confining, uh, some kind of confining potential you impose by hand. And now you can release the potential, okay? Just remove the potential. And then, uh, and then this, uh, uh, this cigar shaped uh, atom, uh, atomic gas will expand. And the expansion uh, uh, behavior will be very different. Say if this flow uh, behaves like just a, ga a gas of random particles which have local relation with each other or behaves like a fluid. Okay, if it's like a gas of random particles, they just move ballistically. And then, then because there's not no particle here. So, so, so very quickly you will see uh, uh, this cigar shape just become isotropic. Yeah, so the motion of the particles will essentially be isotropic. But if it's a fluid, but if it behaves like fluid, and then uh, uh, and then you can assign a pressure, okay, into the uh, uh, for the fluid, uh, the pressure have to be balanced, and then then the pressure gradient will be larger along this horizontal direction than the radial uh, than the uh, vertical direction because horizontal direction is much shorter, okay, so the so your pressure uh, gradients will be larger, so the pressure uh, pressure gradients larger in the horizontal direction also means that the velocity of the particle moving in the horizontal direction should move faster, okay? Uh, and so, 
uh, yeah, so this is normally called elliptic flow. And so that will be an indication that this uh, atomic gas behaves like a fluid. And indeed, an experiment shows that. So, so you see that the, um, the, uh, uh, the atoms along the horizontal direction actually moves faster. Okay. And so, uh, uh, yeah, so this atomic gas exhibit collective flows governed by, uh, by hydrodynamics, uh, indicate, uh, indicating a viscous fluid. So to summarize, so we find, so we uh, uh, consider the three different, uh, uh, say, uh, somewhat exotic matter, uh, quantum matter, one is quagum plasma, and the one is graphene, and uh, one is electrons in the graphene, and the one is the discode atom gases. And each of them, they governed by completely different interactions, and they are at very, very different temperatures. Okay, so, so for quagum plasma, uh, uh, the underlying interactions are strong interactions and the temperature is extremely high, 10 to the 12 K. So this is the, the highest temperature can be realized, um, uh, um, yeah, say, say in the experiment. And, uh, uh, and then the graphene would be just cooler interactions between the electrons. And uh, so this is just roughly room temperature. And then for the, um, for the, for the cold atom, uh, uh, for this cold atom gas, you, it's atomic interactions at the unitary limit and, and it's temperature very, very low, 10 to the minus nine, okay. So, uh, so the question is why somehow the hydrodynamics so effective in governing this such very different systems, okay? With very different interactions at very, very different temperatures at, at very different uh, temperature scales, okay? So it turns out that there's actually a very simple reason behind it, okay? So the reason is very simple. So let's just consider, say, uh, a long wave. This, the, yeah, just consider, say, you have a system in some equilibrium, some kind, some kind of quantum many-body system in equilibrium, and then let's consider long wavelength disturbance of the system. Uh, yeah. So, so by long wave disturbance, we mean the uh, the wavelength of disturbance is much much larger than the mean free pass. Okay. So you should view the. Say, say in this figure, you should view the vertical axis, the horizontal axis say as some kind of spatial direction and the vertical axis as the magnitude of some observables, okay? So the uniform uh, means that the, you are in equilibrium and then, uh, and then now you have this kind of sinusoidal behavior, you have some non-wavelength excitations, okay? And now if you have a non-conserved quantities and the, yeah, the, the evolution, the subsequent evolution of such a disturbance depends very much, much on whether this uh, uh, disturbance is for conserved quantity or non-conserved quantity. Suppose if you uh, say, say this is for non-conserved quantities and then the system actually uh, 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 can relax locally, okay? So essentially uh, 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 at every point in, uh, in space and you can just, yeah, uh, 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 you can just go back to equilibrium locally and uh, then the time scale uh, just controlled by your uh, typical, uh, say, mean free time. And the length scale associated with this just associated with by, uh, by the mean free, uh, 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 mean free pass. Okay. But if you have a conserved quantities, and conserved quantities cannot relax locally because they're conserved, okay? And the only way for the conserved quantity to relax is for the, uh, for the, uh, uh, for the deficit to be compensated by this extra, okay? Uh, uh, so excess have to compensate uh, 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 the deficit. So the only way that the system can uh, go back to equilibrium is through transport uh, uh, of the degrees freedom among different uh, regions. And now if your wavelength is very large and then, then the time scale for it to relax then also uh, become very large. Say suppose your wavelengths go to infinity and then the then the relaxation uh, then takes very, very long time for this access to go to the uh, deficit region and then relaxation time also goes to infinity. So this means that if you are interested in physics at scales much, much larger than the mean free pass and time scale much, much larger than the mean free time, the only dynamics of conserved quantity are, uh, are relevant because all other uh, non-conserved quantities, they just uh, relax locally and they're already in local equilibrium. Okay, but, but, but conserved quantities 
uh, uh, for uh, take very long time for um, uh, for them to uh, to relax. Yeah, so the only non-equilibrium uh, quantities are associated with those conserved quantities. And as I mentioned at the beginning, that hydrodynamics is precisely the theory for conserved quantities. So it's a theory for the energy momentum conservation. And uh, and the, so so for this reason, uh, uh, this is actually a universal theory for for long equipment dynamics of generic uh, quantum many body system so at sufficiently long distance at time scales. So actually, it doesn't matter what your underlying interaction is. Okay, so for for any quantum many body system, and if you go to the time scale and the length scale much much longer than your mean free pass, and then that should be governed by hydrodynamics. Okay, so the uh, so this is the key. And so, so this explains somehow why these three quantum systems, which are separated by very, very wide scales, but, but they're still governed by hydrodynamics. The only thing is required is that at the length scale we probe the system, the mean free paths have to be much smaller than that scale, okay? And so that they can be, uh, behave like fluid. So this actually then tell us a very important point is that the mean free pass of all three systems have to be sufficiently short. Okay, so uh, for example, for the quagron plasma, as I mentioned, this quagron plasma created uh, at Brookhaven or at HC, it's extremely tiny. Uh, it's 10 to the minus 14 meter. Okay, so it's very uh, a tiny droplet. But, but the mean free pass of those quarks and gluons have to be much, much smaller than that in order for, for fluid approximation uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to make sense. So in order we can treat this quagron plasma uh, uh, of our fluid. So that means that actually the, the quarks and the gluons created at the a scale, say, say the temperature scale of Brookhaven or AHC is actually uh, 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 very, very short. Okay, so, so that tells us that the quarks and gluons at that temperature scale is still strongly intact. Okay, so the symptotic freedom is still not enough uh, for them to be weakly intact yet. And the same with the graphene, the graphene in the lab is also pretty small uh, at the sides. And in order for fluid discretion to, uh, uh, to apply, then the, then the electrons, uh, uh, the intact, then the mean free paths among the electrons have to be uh, uh, pretty short. And that, and as I emphasize, you can treat the uh, graphene as pure. So there's no, so the mean free pass here is created by electronic interactions, not by interactions with, uh, with impurities because they essentially you can treat there's no impurity here. Okay. So, so purely electronic nature say of the interactions uh, uh, should be pretty strong uh, 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 in graphene. And the same thing with, the, uh, with this code atom gases. And so, uh, it, in fact, we can use the we can use the validity of the uh, uh, the hydrodynamics to describe those systems as a definition that they are strongly intact in quantum liquids. Okay, so we can take the rounds and use hydrodynamics to define, uh, say, strongly uh, uh, a universal class of strongly intact in quantum liquids. Good. So, despite this known and glorious history of hydrodynamics. There's a very important defect. Is that this is formulated as equation motion? Uh, uh, yeah, because just conservation equations and it cannot capture the fluctuations. Okay, so so there there exist uh, uh, so-called non-Dirichlet uh, formalism uh, uh, to to phenomenologically fix uh, uh, to uh, to add in the fluctuation by hand, but such uh, phenomenological fixes uh, 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 are not readily uh, applicable. To, uh, to far from equivalent situations. But there are always statistical fluctuations. Okay, thermal laws are everywhere. And this is the kind of things we, when we teach, say, thermodynamics, uh, uh, we, uh, we want our students to forget, but they're always there. Okay. And uh, they're, they're also important in many physics contexts. And uh, also at sufficient low temperatures, the quantum fluctuation may be important. And so now let me give you just a, 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 a couple of examples, uh, such kind of hydrodynamic uh, uh, fluctuations can be very important. 
So, so the first is a very old, uh, centuries old problem uh, called the uh, ready blow up problem. So this, uh, uh, imagine you have a tank of water, and then you just heat the uh, uh, the water from the, yeah, from the bottom, and then uh, and then say if the temperature gradient between the bottom and the top is sufficiently small, and then uh, then the uh, steady state would be just th there's no macroscopic motion, and you just have a, a gradient of temperature uh, build up along this uh, a vertical direction. But now if you increase the temperature gradient, okay, if you in increase the temperature difference between the, uh, between the top and the bottom, and then there's a critical difference. And then uh, uh, as we know, when you boil the, uh, uh, when you heat up the water, then the, uh, the correction that can happen. And, uh, uh, and this is like a long, uh, uh, so this is, uh, 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 so the transition from this kind of steady states with no microscopic motion and this convected, uh, uh, convective motion, it, it, it's like a phase transition. It's like a long equivalent phase transition. And this non equivalent phase transition is driven by hydrodynamic fluctuations, okay. And uh, uh, so a lot of example which uh, uh, we expect hydrodynamic fluctuation to play a very important role is in the search for the critical points, which is an active program, uh, experimental program, which is uh, uh, right now uh, uh, at Brookhaven. Okay. And so, so the, yeah, this is the phase diagram of QCD. Uh, 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 there are lots of things going on here. Uh, so we don't have to look at the detailed structure of this uh, phase diagram. Just say the vertical axis is the temperature and the horizontal axis is the baryon chemical potential. So essentially it's the baryon density. So at very small uh, uh, baryon density, uh, and uh, we know, say from Natis, and also from the, um, yeah, just from the weak, exp uh, from the Hybian experiment, and this uh, uh, crossover uh, from the hydronic gas and two carbon plasma is a smooth crossover. Okay. But the worries theoretical uh, discussion strongly suggests that when the, um, the baryon density is sufficiently large, the, uh, uh, the transition actually become first order, say from hydronic gas to, to guagum plasma. And then, then there must be a quantum, uh, then there must be a critical point somewhere. Okay. And uh, so, uh, so this uh, experimental program in, in, in Brookhaven is trying to uh, search for this critical point using heavy collisions. So the basic idea is that the critical point should be distinguished by very large fluctuations. So that's the definition of the critical point. And so, uh, so, so when you uh, create the quark one plasma using, uh, uh, using heavy ion collision, so if the quark one plasma for, say the, uh, the temperature or the chemical potential are near uh, this critical point, and then you should see signatures of very large fluctuations, okay? Uh, 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 Including hydrodynamic fluctuations, and so uh, 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 yeah, that's how you say you can find such a critical point. And for this reason, uh, so it's important that you have a formulation, say, of a hydro theory, uh, uh, which can capture such kind of fluctuations. And uh, uh, and the last example uh, which I mentioned is that, say, there could also be uh, 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 some of fluctuations could, uh, could also be important, say, uh, in turbulent flows. So just a very heuristic picture uh, uh, as pointed out by David Riel, say in late seventies, say, say imagine, yeah, we all know that turbulence is a very chaotic uh, 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 motion of the fluid. And uh, so, so one signature of the chaos is that slight disturbance will get quickly magnified exponentially. And now imagine you have some thermal fluctuations, okay, and then naively, those thermal fluctuations can also be magnified by the by this kind of chaotic motion, and then then the very small fluctuations may turn into a macroscopic effect. Okay, so uh, uh, so Real he made the estimate that that he argued actually indeed so, uh, the thermal fluctuation uh, may play a role uh, macroscopically. Okay, but this question is very difficult to study because if you don't have a uh, uh, or, or hydrodynamic theory of fluctuations, and it then, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, it's not uh, 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 easy to study this question. 
So all these examples uh, 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 suggest that we need a formulation of fluctuating hydrodynamics uh, in far from equilibrium situations. Okay. And, uh, and this in turn requires a formulation just not just based on phenomenological considerations, uh, which is yeah, not easy to capture this uh, far from equilibrium uh, situations actually based on some kind of action principle. Okay. Yeah, uh, so you cannot just put the fluctuation in by hand. Somehow you need some kind of principle, a, a first principle uh, to determine the dynamics of those fluctuations. And the searching for action principle for dissipative uh, hydrodynamics also has been a long-standing problem in math mathematical physics, uh, dating back at least to the ideal fluid action of uh, uh, Herculot's, say, around 1911. And uh, during the last decade, uh, there have been many renewed interests uh, from many different perspectives, say, from cosmology, high energy physics, string theory, holography, etc. Okay, so have been many activities. And so, uh, 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 so recently, uh, 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 a couple of years ago, we, uh, yeah, a few years ago, we proposed uh, uh, a complete formulation of uh, uh, fluctuating hydrodynamics. So, so with my uh, former student, Paolo Glorioso, who is now at Chicago, uh, and, uh, uh, and Michael Crossley. And uh, um, yeah, so, uh, uh, so this formulation is based on first principle. And you only need to use symmetries and action principle. Yeah, and, uh, and then the action principle. Okay. Now let me uh, briefly tell you the basic ideas uh, uh, behind this formulation. Okay. And uh, yeah, so, so we use techniques and insights, say from both quantum field series, gravity, and also uh, some insight from holographic duality, yeah, from string theory. Good. So the basic framework to formulate this uh, uh, effective field theory is the uh, 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 frame, uh, yeah, uh, the basic idea, uh, the basic framework to formulate this hydrodynamics is the effective field theory. So the basic idea of the e effective field theory is, is as follows. So let's consider the full path integral, say, of a quantum many body system. Uh, yeah, imagine you can formally write it down. And then you, but, but in general, we are interested in the low energy physics. Okay, so you don't actually need all the, all the fundamental degrees of freedom in your uh, microscopic description. And then what we normally do is we try to identify what are the important low energy degrees of freedom. So we call it phi, say let's call it phi. And, uh, and so those are the degrees of freedom which are essentially, uh, which are essential for, for, uh, for the low energy or microscopic physics. Okay. So what do you do, then you imagine you only keep those low energy degrees freedom, you integrate out all the other degrees freedom. And then you will get the path integral uh, of the low energy degrees freedom and with the effective action. Okay. And so, and, uh, 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 and this S effective will be the low energy effective uh, uh, action for, the, uh, uh, for your low energy degrees freedom. And this actually will capture uh, all your microscopic physics. But of course, in practice, this procedure cannot really be done, okay? And uh, if you can really carry out this path integral, then essentially you have solved the theory. So, so this procedure cannot be done uh, unless you are in some very special uh, examples, say free theory or integrable systems, et cetera. And so, so, so what is done in practice is that we, we identify those low energy degrees freedom, and then we also identify the symmetries and the constraints on this knowledge effective action. And then you just write down the most general theory then consistent with the symmetries. Okay, so, so uh, uh, the parameters in this theory uh, have to be determined by, uh, uh, by say, say by the experiment. Uh, uh, um, yeah, but, but, but this theory would be the most general theory. Uh, 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 um, yeah, should be satisfied by this knowledge degrees freedom. So this has been a very powerful framework and uh, uh, it's essentially the paradigm for, for many areas of physics, for example, in particle physics, uh, the standard model is the effective field theory and also in many areas of condensed matter physics, for example, phase transitions, et cetera. Okay. So we should also be able to, as I mentioned that hydrodynamics is a universal long distance and long time theory governing a quantum many body system. So, so we should be able to formulate hydrodynamics also using this way, okay. 
And but but there are also some outstanding challenges to do that. So so the first is that how do you incorporate a, 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 a dissipation, a, a hydrodynamic a dissipative? And then there's a standard law, say the dissipative system actually don't have an action free uh, a formulation. Okay, for example, just uh, uh, the simplest, just a uh, 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 Newtonian mechanics with a friction. Uh, uh, it's not clear how to write down say action for this kind of equation motion. Okay. And then, uh, and then a lot of questions: What are the dynamic variables you should use to formulate uh, 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 your hydrodynamics? So if you use the standard phenological variables, say the local density, local temperature, or local velocity, then then you quickly realize they're actually unsuitable for first principle action formulation. And uh, so, so the heuristic reason is like a little bit like in the that like in the electrical uh, 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 dynamics. So, so if you write want to write down a fundamental formulation uh, action formulation using the electric and the magnetic fields, you uh, you find it's awkward. Uh, electric field and magnetic field are suitable for writing down equation motion, but they're not suitable for writing down the action. Okay, and here is very similar. So. Uh, uh, those variables that more behave like some kind of uh, the analog of the uh, electric and the magnetic fields uh, 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 for the electric dynamics. And so the question is, what is the analog of the potentials uh, 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 here uh, for the hydrodynamics? Okay. Yeah, the uh, the potentials for this kind of variable. And then, then the last, he said, we have to impose the symmetries and the constraint in order to uh, uh, write down your effective field theory. And then the question is, what kind of symmetries uh, are actually define your fluids? Okay, and how you uh, uh, should be able to def uh, uh, introduce your constraints? Okay, so so these are the ju just immediately challenges you need to address to be able to uh, write down uh, uh, effective uh, to formulate hydrodynamics uh, uh, as effective field theory. Good. So so now I will try to quickly describe. How we uh, address those challenges? Okay. So the first uh, issue is the uh, dissipations. So it turns out this issue is actually naturally resolved by quantum mechanics. So so instead of actually so so when we talk about hydrodynamics, we are, we may think about ah you only need to worry about the classical statistical physics. But it turns out a better point to formulate the theory at a more fundamental level is actually start with quantum mechanics. Okay, then you can take the classical limit. And so, uh, 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 and the dissipation can be naturally addressed by, by starting from, uh, 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 from quantum mechanics. So, so let's imagine in the quantum mechanical system, say we are interested in the dynamics of a line equivalent state, okay. And uh, and the, in the yeah so so you just use the usual formulation so you associate say some initial density operator uh, uh, with your line equivalent state and then you, then you just evolve this time. So so when you evolve a density operator uh, and you actually uh, uh, act by u and you dagger on on two sides and translate into path integral language. Uh, uh, each u and the u dagger they associate with a path integral. Say, say u can be considered as a path integral to integrate from ti to tf. So we normally take from minus infinity to plus infinity. And then u dagger then corresponding to a path integral which uh, 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 which goes in the in the uh, uh, in the opposite uh, time direction. Okay. And so you have actually have two passes. Okay. Uh, uh, two contours. And now when you look at say correlation functions, expectation values, you take the trace. And then you can just trace one end of the system, and to formulate so yeah, uh, for example, you can trace the system at t equal to infinity, uh, at tf equal to infinity, and with initial conditions specified by your uh, uh, by your initial density operator, and then you form this so-called closed time path, or schwinger kadish contour, and which goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, and then go back to minus infinity. Okay, so there's actually two. Uh, copies of the usual path in the growth. And so the key is now you want to develop your effective field theory for system on such a closed time path. Okay, 
so uh, so this is different uh, 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 from our usual formulation. So usual when you define develop, uh, develop effective field theory, say for, for phase transition or for particle physics, uh, or um, yeah, or or for models in particle physics, you only need to consider the single time count. Okay, but here in order to describe this non-equivalent field, you actually need to describe on um, this closed time path. And uh, since you have uh, a counter for mass infinity plus infinity and the and the, uh, and the come back again, you actually essentially double your uh, uh, degrees freedom. Okay, so if you only count the degrees freedom for mass infinity plus infinity, then you actually have twice the degrees freedom. And so, uh, uh, yeah, so you need to essentially develop a framework for effective field theory on this kind of closed time pass. Okay, so, and then you see, once you write down such kind of effective field theory for such a closed time pass, and then the dissipation is actually automatically uh, incorporated in your system. Okay, and the simplest example is just a Brownian motion. So you can also just apply it to a single particle, uh, a single particle, say a heavy particle moving in some medium. Okay, so if you apply it to the uh, to the uh, uh, yeah, imagine you have some kind of quantum probe particle moving some kind of mini, some quantum statistical system, and then you can just follow uh, using this kind of uh, closed time pass. And then you take the classical limit. Okay. So if you're only interested in the classical regime, then you can take a classical limit. And then you find when you take a classical limit, and then then the dissipation, uh, 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 yeah. Uh, so the dissipation is automatically incorporated uh, 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 in your action. And uh, and uh, uh, and this provides the uh, first principle derivation, say, of the action principle of the Langevin equation. Okay. Yeah, of course, this example is very simple. Uh, uh, the non-Gibbon equation already essentially captured all the physics of this particle, but uh, but for more complicated uh, systems, and then this way, then you should then you will be able to capture both the dissipative effect and the fluctuating effect uh, uh, at the same time. Good. Um, yeah. Okay. So now let's move on to the next, uh, the second challenge. What are the dynamical variables? Okay, so now the key is you want to identify, so now you want to identify a universal variables associated with energy momentum conservation. Okay. Uh, somehow I think my, my computer is a little bit, for some reason a little bit overheating. Uh, anyway, yeah, yeah, I think. So. so do you hear some noise from my computer? No, no, it works fine so far. Okay, okay. Yeah, somehow, somehow I hear some fine noise uh, from my own, yeah, uh, uh, myself, uh, uh, then that's okay, yeah. Okay, good. So, so if you want to identify the dynamic variable, the key is to identify universal dynamic variable associated with energy momentum conservation. As I mentioned, that the, uh, the hydrodynamics essentially is the theory of conserved quantities. Okay, say so, so the simplest conserved quantity is just energy momentum conservation. You can also introduce others, say like some charge conservation and etc. But in the simplest situation, it would be just energy momentum. And then the, the then the question is, what would be the variable which is naturally associated with energy momentum conservation? Okay. So here there's a trick. Here there's a mathematical trick. So turns out even if we are only interested in the system, say, so even if we are interested in the non-relativistic system, say in flat space, okay? But actually to derive a hydrodynamics as a, as an effective field theory, it's actually easier to imagine the relativistic context, okay? And then take the non-relativistic limits, okay? So imagine you are in the uh, relativistic context and then imagine you put the system in the curved space time. Okay, so why why this is actually useful? Because when you put your system in the curved space time, because of the energy conservation, because of energy momentum kind of yeah, if your system uh, satisfies energy momentum conservation, then your system should be invariant uh, under diffeomorphisms of the uh, the background uh, metric. Okay, so uh, you put a, cur a curved space time. This curved space time have some metric you can associate with. And as we, learn, uh, as we know from GR, if your matter satisfies the energy momentum conservation, then, then actually that's com compatible with the diffeomorphisms uh, uh, of your background space time. Okay. 
So anyway, uh, because energy momentum can say uh, uh, because energy momentum conservation, then uh, 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 then the system should be a diffeomorphism invariant. So the key advantage of using this trick is that you can convert the statement of energy momentum conservation into a symmetry statement because diffeomorphism now is a symmetry statement, and now we uh, and we know how to deal with symmetries. Okay. Uh, because energy momentum conservation itself is some kind, of, it's just some kind of uh, operator equations. But now uh, uh, we converted it into a problem of symmetries. And now we just need to write down a theory uh, which is the morphism invariant. Okay, uh, 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 when you have external metric, and turns out that there's also uh, yeah yeah just invariant under any coordinate transformations. And turns out that there's very, uh, also very simple mathematical trick to do it. This is called the Stokerberg trick. Uh, which invented for uh, by, uh, by Stokerberg uh, when he was dealing with the symmetry breaking, and essentially here uh, the basic idea is just you you, you uh, promote your transformation parameters. Say here is a diffeomorphism, uh, it's just some coordinate transformation into dynamical variables. Okay, so here is essentially just pro promote your space-time coordinates into dynamical variables. And so, so your space time x mu, and then you plot them into dynamical variables, and then they become a function of some other space time, some reference space time. Okay. And then you can show that then the uh, equation motion of x mu, uh, 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 then, then just equivalent to the energy moment conservation. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so now you just need to write down uh, 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 some kind of uh, 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 action of this x mu, which is compatible with this diffeomorphism uh, uh, symmetry. So here there's something curious. So when you promote your space-time into, uh, 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 into a dynamical a space-time coordinate into a dynamic variable, means that you need to integrate over all possible coordinate transformations. And then you have to then you have to choose a reference space-time, which I call here. Uh, 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 you have to introduce a gradient space-time, which I call uh, label the coordinate by sigma a. Okay. And uh, and now yeah. Anyway, so. So now your dynamic variable, uh, uh, now you have two copies of them uh, 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 because of this close time pass, you have two copies of them. And then, then you, now your space time coordinates are functions of some kind of auxiliary space time, which you choose as a reference space time, okay? And the, so at first sight, you might feel curious uh, uh, of what, yeah, so, uh, so like your question is what is the, uh, in, yeah, the latter question, what would be the uh, physical interpretation of this auxiliary uh, uh, space time? Okay. It turns out that this just gives you a generalization of the Lagrange description. So now let me remind you what's the Lagrange description of fluids uh, as uh, uh, compared to the uh, Euler uh, 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 description. So, so let's, let's consider just you have a fluid. So here is a fluid flowing uh, 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 past the cylinder. So there are two Description. So one description is the standard Euler description I mentioned earlier. You introduce the um, uh, 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 local density, local temperature, etc. But uh, but but the other equivalent description is that you can put a label on each fluid element. Okay, you can uh, label the each fluid element, and then you just track the motion of each fluid element. Okay, so uh, so now uh, so suppose sigma i label some fluid element. Yeah, because uh, uh, and then then the x i just divide uh, uh, just describe the motion of that fluid element. Okay, so the x i uh, is the spa uh, uh, spatial coordinate, and then the time dependent just tells you how the how this particular fluid element moves in space. Okay, and now we can just naturally interpret this dynamic variable, which we argued from purely mathematical perspective, from this diffeomorphism. Actually, this just provides a Lagrange description. Okay, so. So remember, uh, now we can just label, uh, uh, interpret the spatial part of this auxiliary space time as label your fluid element, individual fluid element. And the sigma zero, then it's the natural generalization you can imagine uh, associated with each fluid time, you can have some, yeah, associated with each fluid element, you can have some internal time, okay. Anyway, so, uh, 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 and then, uh, and, then uh, uh, and then you have this fluid space time, and then this, then this mapping then provides you how this fluid element moves in the physical space time. Okay, uh, 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 move in the physical space time. 
And uh, yeah, uh, 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 so those provide the lateral dynamic variable for you. And then finally, uh, we have to impose symmetries. And then, then there's three class of symmetries you can impose. So one class is just the, uh, uh, the symmetry defining a fluid. Okay, uh, 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 so stated in a very simple way. So we mentioned that this sigma i essentially label the fluid elements, but it should be able to label your fluid element in an arbitrary way. Okay, once you, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, so you should be able to have some, some arbitrary transformation, which is time independent. Okay, you fix, so you fix a, a time slice and then you should be able to relabel your uh, your fluid element as uh, uh, as you want. Okay, so uh, uh, so your semi so your series should invariant under this relabeling of the fluid element. And now also now, if you follow each given fluid element, fix the sigma i, and then the internal time internal clock for this fluid element, you should be able to choose arbitrary uh, parameterization. Okay, and then. Anyway, uh, 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 so those defines the symmetry of a fluid. For example, if you have a solid, and then uh, uh, each solid uh, uh, element doesn't have the equilibrium uh, uh, locations, then you don't have such kind of uh, a relabeling symmetry. Okay, so so you can say this symmetry, this symmetry is just defining a fluid. And then there's some other constraints from quantum utility. Say because we are uh, thinking about a quantum many-body physics, a quantum many-body system uh, defined on this uh, uh, closed time pass, and then they are constrained from uh, from quantum utility, which actually turn out to survive in the classical limit. Okay. And also, there's uh, uh, it turns out there's also a lot of Z two symmetry, uh, anti-linear Z two symmetry you have to impose, uh, uh, which called a, a, a dynamical KMS symmetry, and essentially impose. Uh, uh, tell, uh, uh, which imposes that your macroscopic uh, system is, uh, 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 should have time reversal invariance and the local equilibrium. Okay. Anyway, so I will not go into detail there. So once you have those symmetries, and then with those dynamic variables I mentioned earlier, and then then you can just write down the action for statistical field theory and actually fully recovers the standard hydrodynamics uh, or, or, or as equation motions. Okay. And but also can treat the statistical and quantum uh, uh, quantum hydrodynamic fluctuations systematically. And in particular, all the phenomenological constraints, which we normally put in the hydrodynamics by hand, and they automatically incorporate it uh, through uh, through those symmetries. Okay. So so this theory actually have a lot of benefits. It turns out that this theory actually provides the alternative way to derive the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, uh, uh, so it turns out that this uh, KMS symmetry, uh, which you impose to impose the, uh, uh, the, the macroscopic system is time reversal invariant, and also impose that the system should, should have local equilibrium. Turns out this Z2 uh, KMS symmetry is very powerful. A actually, it leads to a loss of currents. And he, since this is actually a Z2 symmetry, it does not lead to conserve the loss of currents, okay? Uh, uh, but somehow uh, a loss of current which is not conserved, uh, uh, this, this two current which is not conserved, but which is actually monotonic, whose charge is actually monotonic. Okay, you can just use the uh, 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 a loss of procedure, loss of like procedure to construct the current associated with this Z2 symmetry. And then you find that the, the charge associated with this current is actually monotonic. Okay, uh, uh, it does not uh, uh, decrease with time. And in particular, you can actually, uh, 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 then you can just identify this current actually with the entropy current and the charge with the entropy, okay. And actually, you can actually work out explicitly the amount of the, uh, uh, the entropy production, okay. Uh, 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 this R, which is corresponding to the entropy production, uh, uh, can be found out explicitly using the action, okay. And actually, this gives you a universal expression for the entropy production. Okay, so this actually applies for general systems, not just hydrodynamic systems. So you can also apply to to general non-equilibrium uh, systems which have this dynamical KMS symmetry. So uh, so this is actually very general. So another feature of this kind of uh, uh, of this action uh, for hydrodynamics is that actually uh, 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 this uh, uh, this KMS symmetry actually have a hidden structure that this theory can always be super symmetrized. So, the, so this theory actually have a hidden emergent supersymmetry. Okay, 
Again, this is very general, just based on utilitarity and this Z2 uh, dynamical KMS image, uh, independent of the details of any specific system. Good. So, so this framework is very general. Uh, it can also be generalized to, to other continuous media such as solid, liquid, crystal, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, 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 there have been many work uh, along this direction. Uh, 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 so these are some uh, 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 some recent generalizations. Good. So 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 for the last few minutes, let me just mention a very quick, uh, very quickly mention uh, 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 application of this effective action to the quantum L, uh, uh, to quantum chaos. Uh, 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 so this is with my uh, 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 former postdoc Mac Blake and a, a, a student at MIT uh, Hans Jörg Lee. So, so chaotic phenomena are ubiquitous in nature. So we have seen them uh, in many, many places. And then the much has been learned about the chaos in classical systems. But much has been, uh, uh, but much more has to be understood for, uh, but for quantum many body system, we still know very little. Okay, so much yet to be understood for, for quantum many body systems. So for the last few years, there have been intense uh, uh, recent studies of quantum many uh, body chaos using these so-called out of time ordered correlation functions uh, 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 so as main observables to probe this quantum many body chaos. Okay, so, uh, so this is a long story. I will not go into detail there. Uh, so let me just quickly mention uh, 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 the main results of uh, 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 what we did. So it turns out for class of so-called maximally uh, chaotic systems, we, we propose that the, uh, the chaotic behavior can be described by propagation of effective chaos modes. Okay. And turns out that this, we also argue this effective chaos mode can actually be identified with the hydrodynamic mode associated with energy conservation. And then you can just write down an effective action. And now uh, uh, you can write down an effective theory of chaos just by, by writing down uh, 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 such a quantum hydro, uh, a quantum hydro yeah, using this uh, uh, action formulation uh, to write down a quantum hydro theory. And since this is a chaos mode, this is related to the energy conservation. Okay. And because energy, yeah, you can just write down a, a quantum hydro theory associated with energy conservation. And uh, so, uh, yeah, so let me just uh, very, very quickly mention some implications uh, of the series say it explains connection between energy diffusion constant and the quantum chaos observed in various uh, systems, and also predict a new manifestation of quantum chaos called the uh, post skipping phenomenon. And also uh, uh, reveal uh, uh, some uh, surprising connection between the quantum chaos and the, uh, and the hydrodynamics. Okay. Good, so, uh, so let me just summarize. And uh, uh, hydrodynamics play a very important role uh, in characterizing uh, uh, various uh, exotic uh, quantum matter. Uh, I mentioned three examples, quagram plasma, graphene, and, uh, and the uh, 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 arch code uh, atomic gases. And, uh, and the fact that those exotic uh, matter uh, as, uh, obey hydrodynamics can be used as a definition that they actually uh, uh, they are strongly coupled quantum liquids. And also now we have a first principle formulation of hydrodynamics, which incorporates statistical and quantum fluctuations. And also I mentioned uh, a, a very surprising connection and to use this hydrodynamics to describe the, uh, to do this quantum hydrodynamics to describe maximum quantum chaos. Okay, we'll stop here, thank you. Well, thank you very much for a very nice presentation. Uh, now we will have some questions. So the first one is Giorgio Terrieri, go ahead. Hi, um, just two related comments. If fluctuations are important, which basically means that the number of degrees of freedom is small in, in some sense, I do not see how is it possible that the second law of thermodynamics is exact. If you have fluctuations, you will have some probability for entropy decreasing, it's just that entropy will increase much more often. Um, and the second point regarding the phomorphism invariance is that if you continue with the gradient expansion, uh, if, if, if you continue with the gradient expansion in the, at the semi-classical limit, you have some, you have Ostrogradsky's theorem, which basically says that 
um, at higher orders, you will have more and more ghost modes. And one has to basically either take them out by hand or introduce new degrees of freedom, which I think is where Israel Stewart is where Israel Stewart hydrodynamics um, comes from. I don't think you can avoid Ostrogradsky's theorem it means you cannot avoid an infinite tower of degrees of freedom every time you add a new gradient. Um, just two comments. Good, good. Yeah, uh, 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 I think both are very nice comments. Yeah, let me just uh, first uh, 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 address your first comment. Yeah, indeed. Uh, uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, 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 yeah, I should be a little bit more explicit. So the second law of hydrodynamics is derived when you assume equation motion. Okay, just this action principle. Yeah, so so this thermodynamic, uh, 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 yeah, so this uh, equation, uh, uh, so this second law is in the thermodynamic meaning, uh, limit in the sense you have already imposed uh, the equation motion. Uh, uh, so in this sense, it's not different from your um, derivation from say uh, from the Boltzmann. Yeah, it's, it's the same regime uh, 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 as the Boltzmann uh, way to derive the second law of that, uh, thermodynamics. And uh, but but indeed this framework, say if we include the fluctuations, say uh, using this path integral, indeed you should also be able to study uh, the fluctuations of the entropy, and indeed uh, uh, th that would correspond to some kind of say uh, a quantum, uh, uh, some kind of statistical version of the world identity. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, 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 this is indeed a, a statement based on the. Uh, um, um, uh, 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 based on equation motion. Yeah, and then uh, uh, regarding your second comment, yeah, indeed. So uh, uh, if you treat, say, the second derivatives or high, uh, uh, higher order derivatives as fundamental, uh, 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 yeah, as part of your fundamental action, uh, uh, then indeed you will have ghost degree freedom and, uh, and then uh, will uh, yeah, make them to be subtle. So one thing one can treat this kind of thing is that you, um, you uh you treat those higher derivative terms really by by perturbations. Uh, by perturbations, and uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, in, it's, yeah in this aspect, this theory is not uh, uh, different uh, from the standard derivative expansion. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question is Pavel Kofton. Um, hi, Hong Pavel Kofton here. Hey. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you for a very nice talk. Um, I have a question about uh, this um, effective theory for, um, for chaos. Um, so, of course, not all systems are maximally chaotic. And uh, it would be very nice to have, so to say, first principles approach to this chaotic dynamics, which is not based on, um, uh, not based on, so to say, reverse engineering the holographic description. Um, Right, so I was wondering if you had uh, comments on that, or maybe how to formulate uh, the effective theory on a contour that is more than uh, schwinger kelder Right. Uh, yeah. 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 That's also a very important question. Um, yeah. For for this quantum chaos, um, for uh, when you go to a uh, long quantum non mac yeah. First, it's a uh, uh, yeah. When you go to non maximal chaos, indeed, the story become much more complicated, and. Uh, uh, and, and there are many indications that such a theory is not hydrodynamic in the sense that not only the conserved quantities are important, but actually uh, uh, there, there are also non-conserved quantities which are important. Uh, for, uh, for example, some higher spin currents, uh, et cetera. Yeah, so, so at the moment, uh, yeah, I don't know how to, uh, how to describe the, uh, the general uh, um, the general uh, uh, chaotic theory, yeah, but, uh, uh, a general chaotic effect, yeah, uh, uh, effective theory for general or uh, uh, chaotic system, um, yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, next question is from Garrett Dunn. Go ahead. Hi, um, sorry if I missed this, but could, could you just talk in a little more detail about how you distinguish uh, fluctuations from like statistical or stochastic origin from those of like a quantum origin, I didn't understand uh, how that separates technically. 
Okay, good, good. Okay, yeah, yeah. I didn't uh, uh, go in very detail. Yeah, I didn't uh, have time to go into detail that. So, so the basic is the following: is that you uh, let me maybe just go to here. Yeah, go to here. So, so let's just using the example of a brown emotion. Okay, so so, so you just can see the single particle, heavy particle moving some medium, which you treated as a, a, a as a background. And then you just write, uh, 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 and then you can write down the quantum theory for this particle. And uh, uh, using this close time, uh, 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 yeah, uh, uh, you can write down a quantum effective action uh, 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 for this particle by integrating out everything else, by integrating out your bath. And so this quantum uh, 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 system then have essentially uh, uh, two kinds of degrees freedom, uh, 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 two kinds of parameter say one kind of parameter is the, uh, yeah, for this particular uh, simple system, uh, uh, one is just H bar, generating H bar, uh, a quantum mechanical H bar. And the other uh, uh, is the, uh, 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 the kind of fluctuation of your background, okay, uh, 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 of, your, uh, of your bath, uh, uh, say uh, uh, maybe, uh, maybe the uh, entropy density of your local bath. And so, so when you take the H bar, uh, 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 when we do the classical limit, you take H bar goes to zero. And then, the, uh, then essentially the quantum fluctuation, they decouple and they go away, but the path integral remain because you still have statistical fluctuations. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so there's a systematic H bar goes to zero limit. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, I think we have a follow-up question from George Barrieri. Hi, no, just, just as a follow-up, you mentioned, I mean, you made this really good analogy with the bolts. I mean, your monotonic, um, your monotonic law of conservation of entropy is basically Boltzmann's, uh, Boltzmann's H theorem. The thing is that in a sense, the Boltzmann equation has no, fluct no thermal fluctuations because what happens is you have molecular chaos, which keeps um, two particle correlations factorized into one particle correlations and you are just keeping one particle distributions. I mean, I think that if that's what you have, if what you have is a reformulation of this based on the same expansion parameter, um, then you are kind of missing, missing the thermal fluctuations somehow because thermal fluctuations are a deviation of this. Um, you see what I mean? And this is what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let me address that. Uh, uh, so, so um, yeah. So, so uh, uh, on the second law, uh, 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 indeed, as I mentioned, there are, uh, there are two parameters here. So one is h bar, and the one for uh, for this problem is more like some kind of number degrees freedom, uh, 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 which characterizes the local den uh, entropy density. Yep. So, so in this regime. You have taken both limits. You take h bar goes to zero limit, and you have taken a thermodynamic limit in the sense that the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the, uh, fluctu uh, the fluctuation effect is not included. Let's say uh, 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 you go to equation motion. So equation motion here corresponding you take the thermodynamic limit, and there's no fluctuation in this region. But but if you work with the full statistical path integral, uh, 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 which we do have here, even after you take h bar goes to zero. And then, then there are fluctuations, which that goes beyond this the uh, Boltzmann's H theorem. Yeah, so you can so you can actually use that uh, uh, you can use that path in the goal to actually study uh, the entropy fluctuations. Okay, um, I think we don't have any other questions from the audience. Any last minute questions before? Uh, oh, actually, sorry, there was there is a question. Uh, well, there was a hand which disappeared. I don't know where it disappeared. Uh, go ahead, uh, Farid. Yeah, hello. Yeah. So uh, thank you for a nice presentation. I have a question about the, in the previous slide, I guess it was uh, uh, in the closed time contour. So we okay. know that it is possible to have instead of, I mean, one go in forward and backward in time, it is possible to have four times of them. Yeah. In, in respect, if, if you have two, I mean, two, I and mean, one in forward and one backward, we know that it is possible to interpret 
the, um, the, the fields as uh, one physical field and the other ones on the stochastic field. So if you have four or more, do, do you have any uh, interpretation or intuition in what the quantities would be? And what, what would the result of this? Yeah, 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 that's a very good uh, 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 question. Um, yeah, personally, I don't have uh, much intuition how to interpret. Uh, you see, so you have, when you only have two, so this is the, this, this include all observables, which you don't need to evolve your system back in time. Mm -hmm. Okay, because that's just corresponding to involve your, uh, your density uh, operator forward in time. And now when you include, say four counters, and then that would, uh, that would correspond to observables which require you not only uh, move your system forward in time, but you also need to move your system backwards in time. And so those of the, yeah, so, so somehow the other additional observables you have, uh, yeah, additional variables you have to introduce somehow heuristically corresponding, uh, heuristically correspond to somehow you have to take into account this kind of effect when you evolve back in, uh, uh, this time. Yeah, yeah, it, it, but they don't have a very simple way to describe them. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, next question from Misha Stefano. Hello, hi, Hong. Uh, thank you very much. Very uh, interesting talk. I um, um, I have a question. I wonder how would you answer, uh, or uh, from the point of view of uh, of this uh, formalism, the following question. Uh, so, uh, when you say cla classical limit, you are saying that h bar goes to zero, but h bar is not dimensional less. It has dimension of energy times time. So when we take h bar to zero, usually that means that h bar is much less than characteristic energy scale times characteristic time scale. So can you actually see what are those scales? What is the characteristic energy scale and what is the characteristic time scale in your formalism that would uh, enter in this sort of uh, definition of the uh, classical limit. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the, uh, so, so I think that, that question may depend on your specific system. So for example, in the simplest case, indeed uh, uh, the H bar goes to zero, it can be formulated say as you, the ratio between say h bar omega, say omega is your typical frequency. So h bar uh, uh, omega, uh, uh, and the, uh, whether that's comparable with your temperature or not. Say if h bar omega is much, much smaller than your temperature, then you are in the, uh, you, you are in the regime which this h bar is not important. And then, yeah, so, so one direct uh, uh, reflection of this is uh, how the correlation, uh, how, the, how this series satisfy fluctuation dissipation relation. So for example, if you look at two point functions, so you have the quantum uh, fluctuation dissipation relation which come from this uh, core, core tangent, uh, uh, say omega divided by T, uh, 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 omega divided by T, but, the, uh, but uh, when you take H bar goes zero limit, you only depend on say one over omega. Yeah, I just, uh, it, it, it just these kind of differences. Um, yeah, but I think when you can make this approximation, I think it will depend on specific systems. Does this answer your question? Or, 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 yes, or not yes. I just wanted to make sure that it matches the way that, uh, you know, landau lifshitz formulation uh, of uh, uh, hydrodynamic um, mm -hmm. um, finds. Uh, may I ask another question? Yeah. yeah. I don't know other questions. Uh, I, um, so uh, one of the uh, applications of uh, um, hydrodynamics, um, uh, which you also describe, is by describing the dynamical evolution of fluctuations uh, in heavy ion collisions. Uh, so uh, we obviously can calculate fluctuations in equilibrium, but heavy ion collisions require us to be able to describe how the, uh, let's say, expanding uh, 
of the um, background medium affects the um, um, fluctuations, which are then taken out of equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So um, is there a way that you see that one could uh, start from the um, uh, this uh, two contour uh, or close contour formalism and derive those equations. Right, yeah, yeah. right, that's a very good question. Yeah, indeed, I think one, one advantage of this formalism is that you can use your uh, standard field theory techniques. So uh, for example, if we consider ordinary quantum field theory, you can use this kind of uh, so-called effective potential uh, technique uh, say uh, uh, one particle irreducible, uh, uh, gen uh, yeah, one particle irreducible diagram, etc., to define a quantum corrected potential, and uh, uh, yeah, for example, this coleman Wenberg potential, etc. And uh, so, in principle, indeed, you can apply that kind of techniques to this kind of effective field theory, and then you should be able to derive some fluctuation corrected uh, equation motion for the motion of a fluid. Uh, yeah, this is something uh, uh, we have been thinking. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, so this would describe in the language, uh, um, uh, in, in, in this uh, terminology, the uh, long time tails. Mm -hmm. Revolution to, to the evolution of average quantities. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, what I am thinking of is about uh, evolution of two point correlation functions. Or the evolution of fluctuations, which is what uh, heavy ion collisions are measuring, right? Mm -hmm. In addition to, to, to one point, the average uh, quantities, they can also measure the uh, correlations of fluctuations, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in principle, there should be a way to start from this first principle, uh, close quantum formalism, and uh, derive equations not only for one point function, but also for two point functions something in the spirit of 2PI formalism. Right, I see. In the field theory. Mm -hmm. uh, have you given- Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, yeah I need to think more about that. I think that's a, 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 that's a very good question, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't see any other questions. So actually I wanted to have a small question myself. Um, regarding the uh, supersymmetry, emergent supersymmetry that you mentioned briefly in, in this context. Uh, is there a simple way of understanding what's the physics implication of that supersymmetry? I understand it's more or less universal. It will appear in any for, uh, hydrodynamics. Then how do we see it? Right, so, uh, so I think that the, uh, the emergence, yeah, so, so here, of course, I didn't have time to talk about in detail so this actually have a very long history. Even in, in, seven, in late seventies and eighties, people have already observed even in stochastical systems. Somehow when, when you impose a, a fluctuation dissipation uh, relation and also time, time reversal, uh, uh, in particular, this uh, person called Goldie, uh, 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 when you impose time reversal, you impose uh, a fluctuation dissipation relation and then the system appears to have a, a, a emergent supersymmetry. But there was more like some kind of observation in very simple stochastic systems in isolated examples. So here uh, we actually have a, a systematic formulation and showing that whenever you have an effective action, which have this so-called uh, satisfy this utilitarity and this dynamical KMS uh, uh, symmetry, and it's always supersymmetrizable. And then uh, uh, you can always write it as a supersymmetric system. So, so naively, this supersymmetry does not do much for you. Uh, you can introduce fermionic variables and uh, 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 you, can, you can put them in a way so that the system is supersymmetric. The, the use, so right now I don't fully understand the, uh, the power of this supersymmetry, but one use of it is the following. is that we impose some utilitarian constraint. Uh, 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 this utilitarian constraint, when you impose at tree level, that can in principle be, uh, be violated, say at higher uh, loop orders but, uh, when you study fluctuations. But somehow uh, when you put in the supersymmetry and then 
the supersymmetry can guarantee the unitarity is maintained at the higher loop order. And so, uh, so it's more like some kind of kinematic thing which help you to simplify your theory. But you can also, in principle, we also uh, have introduced a rather uh, regularization, say uh, uh, we, we show you can, you don't have to use supersymmetry, you can just introduce a specific regularization uh, uh, that will also avoid violation of the unitarity. So yeah, so, so the full potential of the supersymmetry, uh, I don't fully understand uh, ourselves. And uh, right now, uh, uh, this is just observation. Somehow supersymmetry appears systematically uh, uh, just as a consequence of this unitarity and this dynamical KMS. Yeah. OK, thanks. Thanks. OK, uh, I don't see any other questions from the audience. So I guess this is going to be a good point to stop the discussions. Uh, I would like to use the opportunity to thank Hong Liu for a very nice presentation. Thanks for going into the trouble, uh, giving very nice introduction, and then going to the meat of it and giving a very interesting ideas to think about. So thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Pleasure. Thanks.